Welcome to the World FinTech Festival 2020, day three. And today's overall theme is impact. Our panel discussion is being brought to you by FinTech, uh, Singapore FinTech Festival in collaboration with Cambodian Association of Finance and Technology, along with the National Bank of Cambodia, NBC, and the Association of Banks in Cambodia, ABC. We are currently live streaming on SFF platform, not only in the region, but around the globe. Let us not forget our local viewers in Cambodia as they're accessing us on Facebook Live. Just a reminder, if time permitting, we can address questions from the general public. So please send in your questions for a chance to win mobile top-up and a phone from Marquis Sponsors. My name is Remy Pell, Managing Director of IP88 Cambodia PLC. We are a licensed regional payment gateway here in Cambodia and headquartered in Malaysia. I will be the moderator for this session. Now, today's panel will focus on financial inclusion outlook for 2021. Today, I have the honor to introduce our distinguished guests who are notable person, uh, business personalities in their respective industries. I am confident that the viewers will appreciate the vastness and the depth of experience that each panelist will bring to our discussion today. A warm welcome to the panelists. Please kindly introduce yourself to the audience as you are acknowledged. First of all, we have Mr. Or Sokidot, CEO of BC, Credit Bureau of Cambodia. Yep. Good morning, uh, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. My name is Sotirot. I'm the CEO of Credit Bro Cambodia. So actually, Credit Bro Cambodia is a private sector who are consolidating all credit in information in Cambodia. We frame ourselves as the uh, financial infrastructure who are supporting the financial service in Cambodia. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Manu Ra Rajan, CEO of Wing Specialized Bank. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Manu Rajan. I'm the CEO of Wing Cambodia. We are a mobile financial services company established in 2009, so 12 years running now. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much about us. Great. Thank you, Manu. Uh, next, we have Ms. Frandara Kun, uh, Chief Strategic Officer, True Money, Cambodia PLC. Yes, good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, viewers on uh, Facebook. Um, my name is Kun Frandara. I'm the Chief uh, Strategy Officer of uh, True Money Cambodia. True Money Cambodia is a regional fintech uh, company under the uh, Ascent and Ant Financial Group. And uh, we've been uh, here in Cambodia uh, more than five years and uh, pleased to be part of the panelists today and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Remy. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Sanjay Chakrabati, CEO, Prudential Cambodia Life Assurance PLC. Sanjay, I think there you, you go. Yes. yes. There you go. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Remy. Um, as, as Remy was saying, uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Prudential. Uh, Prudential has been around in this market for over eight years now. We are uh, one of the largest players. Uh, we have one of the highest number of customers. And um, what we do here is basically our drive to make healthcare uh, accessible and affordable to all. Uh, and, and as we go through the discussion, uh, we will see some of that. So very happy uh, to be part of the panel. Thank you, Sanjay. Next, we have Mr. Kir Buran, CEO of A AMK Microfinance. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, evenings to um, everyone uh, in the country around the globe. Uh, my honor to be here in the in this panel. Uh, I'm Buran, the CEO of, of AMK uh, Microfinance Cambodia. AMK is uh, one of the microfinance deposit taking institution which offer um, you know, different financial products to um, Cambodian people. We particularly focus on low-income populations. Uh, our reach is, is uh, uh, quite uh, high uh, in, in, in terms of demographies and customer base. Uh, we work in over 90% of Cambodia uh, with over 5,000 uh, distribution network across Cambodia. Um, and we again purely focus on uh, low income populations uh, in Cambodia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, 
we have Mr. Charles Sapiet, SVP, Head of Products and Development, Aklita Bank PLC. Uh, thank you, uh, Remy. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm Sapiet from Aklita Bank, uh, PLC, Cambodia. And Aklita Bank established uh, by the local, uh, small local NGOs in uh, 1993 and have been graduated to be uh, uh, the, the commercial bank and uh, used to be the number one bank in Cambodia. And right now, uh, we are uh, set our project as the digital bank in Cambodia and uh, in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now that the formalities have been out of the way, let's get to the topic at hand. Uh, this first question is for everyone. Um, if we look at the evolution of financial inclusion, it used to mean that we try our best to proliferate access to financial services to the most vulnerable people in our society who are prone to risk of poverty and social exclusion. However, now it's evolved to not only having access, but how these products and services have meaningful impact to individuals and businesses, and how they use these products and services to enrich their lives and spur economic growth. Can each of the panelists share your experiences of adoption or maybe a challenge of the drivers that mold and inspire your business plans when it comes to financial inclusion? Manu, can you start, off, start us off first? Sure, Amy. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so being uh, started in 2009, and when I, uh, so we, we started with an objective of using mobile financial services to drive up financial inclusion. Uh, so what happened was uh, when we started in 2009, um, we, we were started as a pilot project by the National Bank of Cambodia and the ANZ Royal Bank, which is part of the conglomerate royal group of companies. We tried to onboard customers, the unbanked customers, into the formal banking uh, fraternity, just like how a banker would try to do. And we failed. So we also jokingly say we are one of the first failed fintechs in Cambodia. So, uh, so it was after ANZ Royal sold the company to the current shareholder, Royal Group of Companies, that we realized the change in financial inclusion has to be predominantly driven from the customer behavior point of view. Now, creating policies, creating benchmarks, frameworks, it does help in making it safe, secure to transact. But if you have to change the behavior and what, what comes in the way of financial inclusion uh, is actually the customer self-confidence and comfort level. Uh, in joining themselves into the formal financial ecosystem. So that's the biggest learning we learned and the biggest hurdle that we had to overcome when we started in 2009. So how we, how we overcame that hurdle was by providing an aided digital transaction model, and which is the uh, most celebrated agent banking model now. Now we've got about 8,600 agents in every nook and corner of the country who is providing um, uh, convenient transactions, financial transactions for the unbanked population. So from that point of view, uh, with about 11 million customers now, uh, does it provide access to financial services to Cambodians? Yes, there is easy access to financial services to Cambodians if they prefer to, but only through the agent banking model. So that was the biggest hurdle that we had to overcome to bring people on, to on board the uh, ecosystem and be able to identify that there is somebody who uh, is making use of a certain financial transaction. So we use mobile numbers to do that. So 11 million mobile numbers every year is using it in a 16.5 million uh, population country. That is a large number with about... Um, uh, 90, almost 90 percentage of the addressable population using it. Now, uh, there are more hurdles there. Now, this is an aided transaction model. Now, if you really want to drive financial inclusion by customizing financial products and solutions for these people, uh, you actually want them to do these transactions themselves. 
you do not want to depend on the agent banking model always so that's the next hurdle that we have to overcome and in the 12 years of our existence what we have learned is that uh, it is customer trust self confidence and use cases that come in the way of financial inclusion now after that the, so once that is taken care of the next biggest hurdle we have to overcome is financial literacy but uh, that we will talk more about later but um, when we started and when we wanted to drive financial inclusion i guess these were the hurdles that we had to overcome and in our opinion cambodia is a shining example of financial inclusion to the rest of the world with almost 90% of the addressable population having access to uh, easy, easy access rather to financial instruments yes great great thank you thank you for your comment it looks like you started off with a challenge and then it uh, grew to some some adoption and, and, and you're taking off that way. Uh, Mr. Sanjay, I just wanted to, you know, insurance is relatively new to Cambodia. How How is that affecting your financial inclusion programs? Thanks, Remy. Um, as you rightly pointed out, um, in, in our minds, in our thought process, uh, insurance really uh, is, is not a big component of the financial inclusion drive as we see it today. Uh, but let me just sort of step in and, and, and sort of point out that the whole thinking is a bit flawed there. Um, you have the, the, the consumer needs, you have the banking needs, and you have the investment needs, your need for credit, your need for payments, your need for savings and so forth. But until and unless you can remove financial vulnerability, uh, none of this really takes off. Uh, people will not borrow if they know that if something bad were to happen, their family would be saddled with all the liability, that sort of a thing. Right? Uh, so that's where we really come in uh, to, to sort of address the need for protection. Now, historically, uh, even though the industry is, is new, it's not all that new. Uh, you know, it's been, uh, we've been around for eight years or so. Uh, so historically, the focus has been on uh, people, that particular segment that's making, you know, four hundred dollars a month sort of uh, um, household income, uh, which means a very large part of the country is not uh, even being thought of uh, as, as targets for uh, protection products. Uh, we are trying to break that mold. So we are talking about bite-sized products that we are able to deliver. Uh, of the digital platform. Uh, these are uh, pay-as-you-go uh, products, very, very targeted purpose, very targeted usage. Uh, we are working with our partners, our bank partners, um, Manu and Mr. Sophia, they're both here, uh, to take these uh, to the customers. Um, and in the remotest parts of the country, and as we go along, uh, we will also discuss how even if, even if, um, people haven't yet become our policy holders. We are committed. Uh, we are. We have uh, sort of taken the pledge that we will drive uh, healthcare and protection in the country. So we will talk about some of the features we've introduced in this market, which sort of empowers uh, families and households uh, to take charge uh, of their protection needs, their health needs. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanjay. Uh, Bongo, uh, True Money is a regional e-wallet. So, can, are there some examples from maybe in Cambodia and also maybe some of the other countries that that uh, True Money operates in? Yes, uh, thank you, Remy. Um, Aligned with uh, what Manu uh, just mentioned, um, we also faced uh, the same challenge uh, when it comes to you know uh, driving um, um, uh, financial inclusion in Cambodia. However, we, there's four pillars that we are really focusing on, and this is leveraging from our regional experience, given the fact that too many uh, Thailand have over 9 million uh, wallet users uh, as of today. So the, the four pillars will be uh, digital identity. Um, we are implementing EKYC, um, you know, to overcome, uh, you know, and facilitate um, the uh, pain point of the users. That's one example. Uh, our platform is, uh, you know, to uh, securely onboard uh, users. Um, I think also one of the roadblocks is uh, digital uh, connectivity. Um, having said that, feature phone, um, 
are, you know, uh, excluding themselves from the opportunity, um, you know, uh, brought by financial in inclusion. So I think, uh, and, and this is good for Cambodia, it's a good sign because everybody has a, a smartphone. Uh, so, uh, you know, this uh, um, uh, challenge has been, you know, uh, addressed and we've seen it with the adoption of our app usage. Uh, the third point is around uh, ease of use. Um, you know, frictionless, uh, we're very emphasizing on user journey and uh, we, we believe that uh, Cambodians uh, like things to be simple, convenient. So within three clicks, you know, you should be able to uh, send money or, or receive money. So this is, you know, uh, all the best practice and the leverages that we're getting uh, from, uh, you know, our regional countries where we're in um, and we, we strive for but uh, with, with or without financial inclusion, you know, uh, we, we certainly, uh, you know, uh, keep learning throughout the journey every day and improve along the way. Thanks, Remy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Mong So I just want to understand how CBC uh, uh, addresses the issue of financial inclusion from the yep. uh, credit standpoint. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Remy. In fact, I, I concur with what you you have introduced that financial inclusion is not only about access to finance, but it also needs to be have meaningful impact over that accessibility. Actually, Credit Bureau Cambodia, we start with a challenge. We start with the one of the big challenge that the industry facing is information asymmetry, which you, we can simply refer to the gap between the information from the lender and the borrower. Uh, in the industry, the borrower might not disclose the lender with the full information. And then the lender end up with, without full information, they might be exclude customer from that uh, financial inclusion. So to fulfill that gap, Credit Bro Cambodia was established in 2012 to be the key financial infrastructure for Cambodia. Actually, we, we, we do not provide financial service, but what we provide is the information that information can be a part of, for example, credit report, can be credit score, can be monitoring service. However, that information is very crucial for the bank and microfinance to have the informed decision. Yeah. And we also observe that, for example, uh, having that information assessed by lender and also disclosing the information of the borrower, we can build their prudential collateral. Uh, as a result, we can bridge that information gap. And we are also proud to say that as of now, we are not only serving the, uh, the bank and microfinance, we are also serving the end user, which is the, the, the consumer also. And then what we are trying to serve them is to make sure that they can access to their credit report, they can review their credit file to make sure that they can frame their behavior, to make sure that they can pay their, their way, they can be prepared for financial inclusion later on. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you. I, I'm just going to follow up with you on that. And uh, I'm just kind of personally curious is that, you know, access to finance, you kind of need the identity, you know, whether it's online or, you know, with your national ID. So does are is the credit bureau developing new alternative ways to identify people and, and, and maybe provide a credit score in that sense in, in the non-conventional way? Okay, uh, very good question, uh, Rami. Actually, uh, friendly speaking, in other bureaus, for example, in the country that they have the unique ID, it's very easy to identify people. You can use, for example, Singapore, you can use better sing pass and then you can identify people uh, very easy. Cambodia is a different perspective. If you look at the bank and microfinance, they use multiple ID. They accept, for example, the national ID, the passport, driving license. The, uh, uh, up to now, we have around 10 identity. So the power of CBC is that regardless of what identity they are using, at the back end, we have our acronym in order to match people. I'm sure that, for example, we might use, for example, all the name, gender, that of birth, place of birth, a lot of things in order to back end can match people. So at the end, we just return the, the, the file matching to the FI only. And I'm also proud to say that when we start the bureau at the beginning, our matching rate is, our, is around 70%. Now mm -hmm. we grow our matching rate to around 85%. 
So meaning wow. that out of a uh, hundred files that we received from the bank and microfinance, we can return at least 85%. Great, 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 great. Okay, Bong uh, Sophia, how does a leader address uh, financial inclusion and, and how do you gauge your success that way? Uh, Bong, you're uh, on mute. Can you unmute yourself? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank yes. you, Remy. As I addressed at the beginning, that actually uh, that bank said uh, uh, ourselves that uh, to be the digital bank, it means that uh, we will provide all the bank service uh, in a digital uh, channel. Um, let uh, me uh, give a, a, a simple example that uh, digital bank uh, service uh, can uh, help to improve uh, customer or social. Uh, 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 living uh, standard is uh, for example uh, if one customer uh, need to pay their uh, utilities like uh, water electricity and uh, 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 let's say uh, the rubbish and uh, when they pay one time they need to if they, without a digital uh, channel they, they 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 must go to the office uh, then at the time they, they must uh, spend their uh, cost to travel their time to uh, to go and with this you know uh, all are bearing the cost and let's say one time uh, just one dollar if if uh, we pay for three types of uh, item it means three dollars if uh, one of uh, let's say one customers uh, need to pay this amount of money uh, with, uh, within one month and uh, uh, if uh, let's say uh, uh, six million people so it's a uh, six million uh, multiplied by three so at least we gain uh, six million multiplied by three uh, us dollars per month but actually to sell the digital uh, service it's not just only like, like that the customer come to the uh, bank office they are not just only come to uh, make a payment but they come to make a fund transfers they come to uh, to withdraw all to deposit to manage their, uh, their cash like uh, they want to come to um, take the uh, to, to uh, uh, request for their card or to open their account but with the digital uh, channel customer can do it by themselves anywhere anytime and the transaction will uh, in, uh, will made uh, instantly and it is the effective that the digital channel very helpful to 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 help uh, the, the the people of a uh, uh, better living standard and uh, uh, a way yeah. out of the pop, uh, property yes. uh, standard. Yeah, thank you, Bong. Uh, you you mentioned uh, payments. You mentioned uh, funds transfer. Bong Bodan, if if we look at our financial inclusion discussion, it would not be complete without mentioning Bakong, our new pay, uh, backbone payment and settlement infrastructure. And Bakong is the key solution for the promotion of financial inclusion, as it's the universal first steps to enter the formalized ecosystem. Uh, everybody needs to make, a, make, uh, needs to make a payment. So how does AMK um, embrace Bakong and, and to support your financial inclusion programs? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, you know, I think before uh, probably I touch on Bakong particularly, uh, I want to also, I think, highlight it. I think in terms of financial inclusions, I think we need to, uh, see it as a roadmap, uh, um, rather than as 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 uh, you know something had been done or uh, achievement because uh, different people uh, would have different needs uh, within their life cycle. Uh, secondly, uh, we also need to know you know how do we actually be able to get you know people to use multiple services, uh, uh, which I think enable uh, you know to improve their their financial management and and lifestyle. I think as we see in Cambodia, I think two predominant success is payments and probably lending credit. Uh, I we can say yes. I think you know majority of Cambodian basically now can actually access payment through uh, different 
uh, you know, banks, financial institutions, fintech company, credit the same. The, the, the outreach on in terms of credit are so large in Cambodia. Uh, a lot of banks and microfinance working in over 90% of the village. So which means, you know, everyone in Cambodia basically can access formal, formal financial services. I think one thing which is missing is the in, you know, interoperability between all the, 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 the player uh, that uh, will have to reduce the cost uh, because I think you know, if everyone keeping, keep going to the same village, um, uh, uh, visiting the same customers, providing different services, the costs that we incur are so large. And, and that I think would, would not basically good for us as the, as the financial service provider, but also not good for a customer because at the end of the day, the cost will pass to the end user. So I think back home, we, it's just starting. Uh, uh, we have to actually do a lot more to embrace the success of this platform is to allow, I think, all the players in the sectors to uh, be able to work together uh, to deliver service to the end user at a lower cost. And that, I think, would, number one, reduce the cost to the end user, which will improve their financial condition. Number two, would include more people who probably don't want to pay the cost because it's so expensive. Now, to be willing to actually do it because the cost are actually a lot less. Plus, I think the, 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 the availabilities or accessibilities of those point of services are actually a lot more because you know, we can collaborate and share our resource to serve those customers. So to me, to, you know, to actually reach to that goal is, is two things. One is infrastructure, which we have to you know, continue to improve further. Second is the willingness and collaboration between all the player to actually offer that services to the end user at affordable cost and, and you know, at, at, at a better, easy, simple, and, and with wider accessibility point uh, to the end user. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanjay, just wanted to get your input on how Prudential would embrace Bakong in, in terms of for the insurance industry. Sure, um, so it, it's it's not really intuitive, right? So how Bakong really ties in with, with, with insurance. I mean, if you were to just go and ask someone, they would probably wonder uh, the the interoperability aspect of Bakong uh, obviously is tremendous um, uh, we will uh, link into Bakong at some point and we will see the cost of transactions going down uh, we will have more access uh, all of that obviously will follow through uh, but that won't necessarily give us a huge lift because you know we we already work with wing we already work with a cleader and and these two entities have massive uh, reach deep down into the provinces throughout the country so even when we onboard ourselves onto bakong it's not going to give us a you know a, a very big um, lift it's not going to be a game changer but what's going to be a game changer for us with bakong is when it also allows for interoperability if we can do cross border transactions with let's say malaysia and thailand where a lot of uh, Cambodians actually work, and we can sell insurance uh, uh, that are that are valid in in Cambodia. Uh, that becomes a tremendous, powerful product uh, for this market, uh, for the segment that we are uh, we are targeting. So, uh, so my colleagues and I, uh, we we don't want to sort of uh, be uh, restricted in our imagination based on what we have been doing in the past. Uh, this is a tremendous uh, tool, a tremendous platform backed by the central bank. Mm, hasn't happened in any country. Uh, the cryptocurrency is backed by real assets. Uh, again, it's not something notional. Um, so the power uh, of Bakong is actually mind-blowing. And uh, we, we are uh, very excited when we're trying to see how best we can leverage it. We want to make an impact. So we just don't want to sort of enroll ourselves and say, you know, we are there too with the others. Um, yeah. That's not how we want to do it. Uh, we want to we want to make a real impact uh, with this platform because it is such a powerful and unique platform. Thank you. Thank you. So then 
the next question would be oh, more of an overarching question is, who is driving financial inclusion? I mean, is it industry? Is it government? Because each of the stakeholders, they have their own motivations. So what, what can you provide some insight on that, Manu? Maybe, maybe you can... <laughs> sure, let me, thank you. Um, I would say none of those. Uh, it's actually the customer and the level of financial literacy that they have. Um, mm -hmm. The policies do help, as I said. The policies do provide us with a very conducive, safe, secure environment to do business uh, and also gives a lot of customer protection. But when it comes to actually driving financial inclusion, um, you know, you need to look at it. Uh, these, uh, again, uh, you know, there are two types of markets when it comes to the when you look around the world and see the 200 plus countries, there are two types of markets predominantly when you're talking financial inclusion. The banked population and the economies with high percentage of banked population, they behave in a certain way. And the economies with very low penetration of banking accounts, um, they have a very unique characteristic altogether. So, um, so, uh, so, so what the mobile financial technology, mobile, mobile network operators have done is provide access to a digital device to the to the remotest of villages across the world in uh, developing countries. Take Cambodia, for example. We have over 120 percentage penetration when it comes to mobile uh, phones. When it comes to digital penetration, we have 11 million Facebook accounts. We have over 60 percentage of these uh, mobile phones are using internet. So we have huge dig digital penetration as well in Cambodia. But if you look at customers who are using their digital accounts or their smartphones for financial transactions, that will come drastically down from the 11 million Facebook accounts that you have. Why? Because they have hacked their own solutions out of these digital platforms that we have provided them with. So people go on Facebook, do uh, Facebook Live, try to sell a commodity, the micro SMEs, which is the 98 percentage of a Cambodia's SME segment. So they will go on Facebook, then they will advertise their products. They will tell them, please send money to me on my phone number uh, through uh, an agent in your village. So the person goes on ground, hands over physical uh, fiat currency over the counter to an agent. That agent does a digital transaction to the person who's trying to do a transaction on Facebook. And then uh, that transaction gets fulfilled, right? So what drives financial inclusion so what has happened is what we have captured in this transaction is a mobile number from a village that has sent money at a certain date, at a certain time, a certain amount to another person. You don't have the psychodemographic profiling that you might require to come up with a more sophisticated financial product for this person that could have made the person's life a little better. Now, that's the next phase of financial inclusion that we need to drive. The biggest barrier for that is or biggest driver for that is financial literacy. Thank you. Rick. Okay, good. Then, then I'm going to ask the next question. If if we were to throw out a what if scenario, if we were to throw out, say, what if Cambodia magically became financially literate overnight? How would this affect your business? Does any anybody want to take this question? If no, yeah, Dara? since I finished the last one, so maybe I can okay. start with the next one. <laughs> okay. So not, not only not only the mobile financial transactions, but the overall economy will skyrocket. Just imagine, yeah. now today when we look at the loan distribution in Cambodia, uh, it is still concentrated in towns uh, where there is a physical presence of a uh, financial institution. Now, if every Cambodian know, it knows the importance of opening a formal relationship with the financial institution and the benefits that can come with it, and in the remotest of villages, now we'll have access to finance through digital lending, digital savings, insurance cover, and so on and so forth, and which they can buy themselves on their smartphones that are already process. Um, so so the, just imagine the kind of economic growth that can happen when that happens. Great, great, great. Mangdara, you, you wanted to say something? To add on to uh, Manu uh, Valid's points, I, I totally aligned. I think business will be easier, will become easier for us, uh, you know, the FIs. 
we will be able to focus on R&D, bring more innovative products. Um, so, you know, um, we will definitely roll out, you know, uh, more uh, sophisticated product to cater more uh, to the consumer. So I think uh, one of the challenges that uh, we we facing, um, and this is going back to financial literacy, we, we, we are, you know, we have a mandate and uh, collective efforts uh, to uh, raise financial literacy, um, you know, in order to enable, uh, you know, this uh, a more broader and, and wider. So definitely, if we would become uh, financially uh, literate overnight, that would be awesome, Remy. <laughs> let's, let's pray for that, right? Okay. Well, if, if I may add, I, I have a... Yes. You know, I, I broadly agree. Uh, absolutely, financial literacy helps and, and so forth. But it, it's it's not that the financial literacy comes first and then we sort of set up our uh, mobile financial services and, and that sort of thing. Uh, we have to be mindful that the financial needs are kind of uh, universal, right? So they are they're there, they exist. It's latent because we don't have the products, we don't have the platforms to address them. Uh, so it really, um, the responsibility is on us to take that into account and sort of start with simpler products. For example, with payments, there's already been tremendous progress. And probably the next step is how do we do that with credit? Now that we have a credit bureau, can we sort of uh, get the, the data in one place and assign uh, credit lines to people even before they ask for loans? How do we have visibility on cash flow of uh, SMEs? That sort of a thing, right? And, and then we start building out the products and platforms that bring people along rather than saying it's the financial literacy that will lead to the explosion in, in financial inclusion. It, it sounds a bit like putting the, the, the horse, the, the cart before the horse sort of a thing. So uh, the cause and the effect thing. Uh, but absolutely, I, I do agree that financial literacy is very, very important because it sort of tells people what kind of tools they can use uh, but it's really something that follows. So, so Mr. Sanjay, I, I believe uh, Prudential is developing some kind of AI app. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, sure, um, uh, absolutely. So, uh, one of the things that I said at the start was um, one of the one of the ambitions of Prudential is to make healthcare. Uh, accessible and affordable, uh, empower people to take control of it. So one of the apps that we have launched is Pulse, which is 100% AI based. Uh, you can create your uh, digital twin, if you will, on the app. So you answer a bunch of questions and your, your profile gets created. Uh, and as you use that app more and more, uh, let's say if you go for a run, the app will pick it up and we'll sort of build it into the impact that it has uh, on your overall health profile. So as time goes along, um, you will get more and more accurate information on your general um, health profile. So I would, uh, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, it is again, available to all, um, it's free. Um, it sort of drives the importance of protection. Uh, and as I said at the start, uh, financial inclusion without removing uh, financial vulnerabilities is not possible. Uh, so I would I would urge uh, as many people as possible to use that app uh, to sort of uh, address these issues. Okay, great. Um, one of the reasons, or the main reason, I would say, uh, uh, that we're all online is, but uh, there seems to be some glimmer of hope and and i just wanted to get uh some some uh feedback on will we turn the uh 2021 here will we turn the corner because we have four strong vaccine candidates that are coming online as we speak and governments are passing emergency uh use approvals on a daily basis uh how does how does covid affect your financial inclusion programs and and uh, what does uh, 2021 look like? Uh, maybe COVID will, will go away. Can uh, Mom, would I? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think COVID uh, actually bring, uh, uh, you know, also, uh, uh, not, not bring, but I think, you know, reinforce the, the digital uh, platform. Where because people actually now don't you know cannot go out or don't want to go out as as it 
you know, used to be. Um, I think it does, uh, uh, you know, push people to basically, um, you know, adopting more uh, uh, technologies, uh, online payments uh, to the Zax, which I think is is the is the the the, the, for, the enforcement I think from these uh, you know uh, pandemics. Uh, I think, however, it, it does I think impact uh, quite significantly toward you know. Um, low educated or low income household where they uh, either doesn't know how to do it or have no means to actually doing it and they rely on the trust of human being and i think trust is is is, is a big uh, uh, or very important uh, you know even though they are literate or financial literate i think trust is is a different if you don't trust you know you don't do it uh, that's why, you know, I think Kamori have 11, 12 million Facebook users because I don't lose anything by using Facebook. But I would not, you know, sign up myself using someone else app with my money without trust, right? So I think trust is is a big component uh, in addition to to what we are talking about. Um, and and I, I do hope, uh, I think the 2021 will turn out to be a fast recovery. Uh, I think with all the, the the vaccine available, hopefully in the next few months. However, we have to be cautious that, you know, the vaccine would not be available for the vast, I think majority of people probably to work Q2, Q3 next year. So I think we probably will have to live with this, you know, new normal kind of issue, uh, at least I think on the first half year. And I think the, the impacts from this, you know, one year and a half of the COVID toward, you know, uh, economy, income, uh, is actually would not end or would not recover by mid next year. So I think the financial impacts to those families will prolong or, or I think the consequence of the pandemic will prolong. So I think the impacts of getting people to actually uh, uh, on board to the uh, uh, financial inclusion, I think it become even more difficult uh, compared to, you know, before the COVID. So I think we have to work a lot harder, I think, as a sector, a governments and private sectors to actually, uh, uh, you know, be able to to uh, achieve that because uh, I think uh, uh, it had been slowed down and impacted the whole economy. Great, great, great. Um, looks like uh, we're nearing the end of our session. Um, I just have one just last have one question last that uh, I'd like to pose to the panel, and I think maybe this might be a fun one. Um, today's theme is impact, and as I scan the, my screen, my computer screen here, and I see some that are uh, expats, some are local Cambodians, and someday I assume that we all may be moving on to something bigger and better outside of your roles now. So I'm curious, what kind of impact or legacy do you want to be remembered for, um, whether it's in financial inclusion or just in this industry? Um, I just open it to the floor, Who, whoever wants to take this first. Nanu? <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'll go first. Yeah, so, uh, Wing is already a case study for the rest of the world to emulate, you know, even before I joined the organization. So, over 10 million people already use Wing, etc. So, I would like to be remembered as the person who drove the second financial inclusion wave in Cambodia. In my opinion, the first phase of financial inclusion is already done. People do have easy access to financial services in Cambodia. Um, it has different uh, challenges associated with it, but there is a second financial inclusion wave that I expect to take place in the next three to five years. And uh, that is where the seven to eight million new generation Cambodians uh, will join the um, join that uh, change that is going to take place. And then we will have the existing youth, the 10 million users who are here, uh, who will actually go in for, um, as Sanjay mentioned, different products and services that we have. So that second financial inclusion wave, I hope I'm a part of that. Great, great. Mr. Sanjay? Um, well, our ambition is very simple and very clear. Uh, we want to make healthcare accessible and affordable uh, to all Cambodians. Uh, it's as simple as that. Great, great. Mang For me, a bit differently, um, I would like people to recognize my effort in supporting women in tech uh, in the mm. Cambodian workforce. 
I'm a big fan. Uh, yes. Uh, and since, as you can see among the panel discussion, I'm the only woman. So I would like to leave that uh, legacy uh, part of my uh, financial inclusion journey uh, in Cambodia. Awesome. Awesome. Mong Sotirot? Yeah, I think from the credit bureau point of view, what we want our audience to remember is seeing us as the infrastructure to support the financial system as we, we have been doing already that we, we already have to promote Cambodia to get the rank of servant in access to finance already. And then we want to bring ourselves to be a, a body that can eliminate, that can reuse the financial, that can reduce the information asymmetry by introducing a lot of solution to the financial sector. Yeah. Okay, Mong Sabir. Yes, uh, <clears throat> for Aklida Bank is, uh, we have set our great ambition and uh, it's a great opportunity for us that uh, we are uh, by uh, the COVID-19, we uh, set, uh, we, we, it's uh, a power to push our bank to try our uh, best to, uh, to uh, find the uh, best solution for uh, our Cambodian customers on board in the uh, uh, digital channel. And uh, we tr and uh, we also uh, connect with each other uh, along uh, the strategy of the backbone uh, uh, backbone, and also with this backbone we try and we uh, we are willing uh, to connect with the ASEAN uh, countries so that our uh, country, our people are not alone. Thank you. Great, great. Mamadan. Yeah, I uh, would uh, want to see that you know um, our our customers see, uh, see us as a partner uh, who will be with them to actually mm -hmm. uh, you know support them, assist them, uh, and offer them one stop shop uh, to enable their uh, wish uh, and uh, enable their dream to be achieved by themselves uh, through our uh, you know service we can offer and support. Great, great. So, as we close out today's session, I would sincerely like to thank all the panel panelists. Thank you for joining. Also, like to thank the event organizers, uh, uh, CAFT, NBC, ABC, and uh, I hope that this session was an insight, insightful one and meaningful one. And with that, uh, please stay safe and uh, healthy as as well. And uh, with that, uh, some awkward and some to be clear. Okay. Awkward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.